<laughs> yeah, thank you for, very much for the nice introduction. MariScale modeling has been a promising tool to understand and analyze the complex physical, chemical, and biological systems. Here, let me show you an example of simulating the brain aneurysms by using MariScale modeling. So, as we can see, in the larger scale of the whole domain, we use a continuous, continuum solver to simulate the blood flow. Then let's zoom in to this small region of this aneurysm. In this small, small uh, local region of this aneurysm, then we use another particle solver. So as you can see, we have all the particles of the playlist here. So this multi-scale modeling result is great. However, multi-scale modeling usually requires a huge computation. For example, this computation was formed on a supercomputer. And in many cases, it's often difficult to determine the unknown model parameters. And more importantly, in reality, this type of result cannot be easily used by the doctors. In reality, the doctors may have some data measurements, but these data measurements are usually sparse and indirect. For example, for this case, the doctor may share inject some dye in this blood flow. Then they can measure the constitution of the dye as shown in the movie. Now we try to learn from the data. We try to predict the flow field from this constitution of data. In terms of predicting the model from the data measurements, machine learning has been a promising tool, let's say, in the past 10 years and achieved a great success in a wide range of applications. But for this case, machine learning would fail because we only have the data measurements for the concentration, but we try to predict the blood flow. Machine learning fails because it ignores the physical laws between the concentration and the flow. Recently, my PhD group proposed a new machine learning method by integrating machine learning with physics. So let's, let's look at neural networks here. So we have a neural network, and the outputs of the neural network include the concentration C, the velocities of the flow in the x, y, z direction, u, v, w, and also the pressure P. We can learn the output of C from the measurements of this as I show in the movie. But in the meanwhile, we are construing the outputs of C, U, V, W, and also P by using the physics, basically the novel stokes equation. So this method is called physics informed neural networks or PINs. By integrating both the data measurements for the constitution and also the physical laws, then we can infer the hydrodynamics in the aneurysm. So in the movie, in the left movie with the reference solution of the flow field, and in the right of the movie, it's the network prediction. But and we noticed that this computation is only on a single scale. We cannot zoom in to look at all the playlist particles. So as we can see, machine learning and MySQL modeling complement each other in a unique way. By integrating machine learning and MySQL modeling, we are able to seamlessly integrate the data measurements and also the laws of physics. I have worked on both machine learning and MySQL modeling. So in machine learning, I have worked on the algorithms, theory, and the software. And in MySQL modeling, I have worked on molecular biomechanics, cellular biomechanics, and also developing population scale modeling. Let me start with multi-scale modeling using the example of sql cell disease. sql cell disease is an inherited red blood cell disorder. sql cell disease is the first molecular disease because the root cause of sql cell disease is the mutation in hemoglobin in the red blood cell. The disease is called a sql cell because the the, the red blood cell in the patients would become this kind of sickle shape as shown in the picture here. Sickle cell disease affects millions of people worldwide and roughly 
100,000 uh, 100, people in the United States, mainly African Americans. While one out of every 365 born babies with sickle cell disease. But there are only a few drugs available in the market. When I studied my PhD a few years ago, there was only one drug called hydroxyurea. I'm happy to see in the past few years, in the past three years, three more drugs are available. But these drugs are not sufficiently effective. Let me go to, into some, go to uh, in the details of the sickle cell disease, looking at the red blood cells. In the OC state, we have the normal hemoglobin inside red blood cell. So in the picture shown here, each red dot inside this RBC is one hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin at the normal state. Then we have the normal red blood cell. This normal red blood cell are this biconcave shape and they are soft. Then they can flow freely within the blood vessel. But if in the uh, DOC state, the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell would automatically polymerize into these long fibers shown in the picture here. And these fibers are very stiff. These stiff fibers would push the membrane of the RBC into this C cord shape. Then the C cord RBC are very stiff and sticky. Then they will block the blood flow, as shown in the picture here. So, red blood cell is really a multi scale disease. In the small scale, in the nano scale, we have the hemoglobin and the interactions between the hemoglobins. Then this hemoglobin will polymerize into this fiber. So this is another scale. Then let's go to the RBC scale. In the RBC, we have many, uh, many fibers and they interact with each other and push the memory of the RBC to this sequel shape. So the RBC scale is roughly a micro. So the size of one RBC is eight micro. Then even we can go to another scale in the blood flow. So in the blood flow, we have thousands of RBC in a very small local region. I aim to understand and predict the cycling of the RBCs quantitatively by using the mild scale modeling. In this talk, I will mainly focus on the molecular biomechanics to study the polymerization of hemoglobin. As a first step, we should build a model for the hemoglobin molecules. So here is the shape and the structure of the hemoglobin. Then your model, I use only one, one particle to represent this hemoglobin monomer. Also, we have different interactions between the hemoglobin and the hemoglobin. There are different types of interactions, and the, there are mainly three interactions important for the interaction of between two hemoglobins. In the figure shown here, in the blue region, I show in the top and bottom of the hemoglobin, we have the axial strong interaction. And in the green region, we have the lateral strong interaction between hemoglobins. And also we have the weak attraction in this red region. Then in our model, we use a few small patches on the surface of the particle to represent these different types of interaction regions. For example, the blue region is represented by this small patch, small patch on the top of the surface of the particle. Also, this red region is represented by this small uh, red patch. Then we have the model of the hemoglobin and also we can simulate the interactions of the hemoglobins by using the small patches on the surface of the particle. Then let's use this model to study the dynamics of the growth of the hemoglobin fibers. Let's assume initially at time zero, we already have a nucleus in our simulation, which means let's further skip the step of nucleation of the process. So initially we have one layer of the fiber. Then due to these interactions between the hemoglobins, the free hemoglobin in the solvent would be automatically attracted and attached into this nucleus. Then the fiber grows as shown in a few snapshots here. 
So after a long time simulation, we would have a long fiber shown here. As you can see, the fiber has a two-seated structure. And let's see, if we zoom in to this local region of the cross section of the fiber, we can see a, a seven double stress structure, which means in the cross section, we have in total 14 different strands, and they are formed four, seven pairs because we have seven different axial interactions. This structure, the two structure, matches the experiments pretty well. So in the bottom, in the figure showing the bottom here, is the picture from the experiments. In the two structure, and also we have the cross section, the double, seven double strand cross section from the experiments. Of course, we can also measure the pitch length of the fiber, which is around uh, 20,070 uh, nanometers. We can also measure the mechanical properties, for example, the bending stiffness of the fiber, which are also consistent with the experiments. So by using this small scale patch particle model, we are able to simulate the dynamics of HBS permutation we can observe the detailed HBS fiber structure with the correct mechanical properties. But if we, are, if we try to simulate the polymerization of fibers in the RBC scale, because, we, because in one RBC, there are lots of fibers and they interact with each other. Then if we only use the small scale particle model, then it will be very expensive for computation in the whole RBC region. Then we, we will use the multi scale modeling to address this issue. In the multi scale modeling, we would have two different models in two different scales. In a small scale, we use the previous model. So we have small particles, each particle is one hemoglobin. And we have a detailed structure of the fibers. Then in the larger scale of the model, we cross screen the fiber of RPC. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, hemoglobin fibers showing the here into only one chain of particles. So as showing the bottom figure here. So for the same fiber, we have two different representative representation. In the small scale, we have this kind of uh, detailed structure of fibers. And in the larger scale, we only have one chain of big particles. Then we have the uh, different interaction in the big particles to ensure the correct mechanical property, including the bending potential and also the angle potential. Then how can we use these two different level models in one simulation? Let me show you the idea here. Initially, we only have the small, small scale particles because we aim to simulate the dynamics of this fiber polymerization. We have to start with the small scale particles. Then during the simulation, the fiber grows. If the fiber is longer enough, then we would automatically delete the, the small scale particles in the middle region of the fiber and insert the big, big particles. So essentially, we replace on the fly by the, by, uh, we replace the small particles with the big particles. In the, in the middle part of the region of the fiber. But in the outside of the fiber, for example, in the top or bottom, because we try to maintain the dynamics of the polymerization, then we have to consider the small scale fibers, small scale particles on the top and the bottom of the fiber. Then we have a complete region. In the between, we have both the small particle and the big particle, as shown in the picture here. So basically, we have three different regions. In the middle, only big particles. On the top and the bottom, only small particles. And in between, we have both. So here's the movie of the dynamics. So initially, we only have the small particles. Then during the fiber growth, we replace the inner small particle with the big particles. If the fiber is longer enough, then we delete more, more small particles and insert more big particles. So this process is dynamic instead of pre-designed. When the fiber is, is longer enough or is very long, then we have lots of big particles 
and only the small particles in the top and bottom region of the fiber. Then the key question here is, how can we guarantee these two different scales of models, the small scale model and the large scale model, they are consistent in the physics. Here are some uh, idea. So we try to transfer into information between those two scales of particle, uh, particle two uh, scales of models. For example, let's consider we try to transfer the information from the small scale particles to the large scale particles. We can compute the position and the momentum of the small particles. So to demonstrate the idea, let's consider a sketch showing the left figure here. Uh, in the middle of the particle, we only have the big particles, and then in the top of the region, we only have the small particles. And in between, we have both. So let's assume we have, in the couple region, we have two big particles. And in each big particle, we have in total uh, three layers of small particles, and each layer, in each layer, we have three uh, small particles. Then in, for each big particle, we can compute the mean value of the position and the velocity of these small particles. For example, the small particles in these three layers, then we, we use this kind of mean value from the small scale particle in the bigger particle, which means the velocity and the position of the big particle, the C1 big particle, is computed from the small scale particle. So this is the information transfer from the small scale to large scale. In the meanwhile, we need another way to transfer the information from the large scale to the small scale. And we consider the force planning. For example, let's only look at this, the top layer, in the first big particle, which is C1 bar. So in the C1 bar, we have three small particles. Let's consider how can we compute the force for the big part for the small particles in the C1 bar. So for the small particle in this layer, first we may have some interaction between the small particles with the free particles in the solvent, for example, in the brain uh, particle here. So this is the further term. Then we also have the interactions inside this big, uh, inside the C1, which means, for example, we have the interaction between the first layer and the second layer. We have the interaction between first layer and the third layer. The interaction within C1 is the second term. Then we also have the interactions between the particles in C1 and the big partic and the particles in the C2. So we can compute the interaction between any small particle in C1 and any small particle in this C2 region, which is the third term. But in the meanwhile, we have the big particle for this region C1 and the region C2. We can also compute the force between the C1 and the C2 from the bigger particle, from the bigger scale, which is the, the last term shown here. So we have two different ways to compute the, the same force. Then the final force for this Fi, for this top layer in this C1, we use a weighted summation from both models. So we weighted summation, we compute the weighted summation of this uh, force from the small particle, which is a blue chunk here, and the force from big particle, which is the red chunk here. So this is only for the top layer in C1. But it's a similar, we can analyze the force for other layers, for example, the bottom layer of C1 or any arbitrary layer in C2. By using this two way force and also a position momentum coupling, then we can guarantee the small particle and large particle, they are consistent in physics. So now we are able to simulate a larger scale, more than one fiber. So let's consider simulate many fibers. Then in experiments, if we have two, by two fibers, we may observe two different phenomena. The two fibers may form this kind of x shape cross section, as I show in the uh, figure here. So you can see this x shape cross section of two fibers. All these two fibers may form 
a side to side to a side to side zebra as showing in the picture here. So you can see these two fibers, they are form a zebra structure. So this is what we can observe in experiments. So let's consider to simulate a fiber domain. Let's consider uh, in, the, in our simulation, we have in total 16 random nuclei. I'll show you in the picture here. They have random position and a random rotation. Then we simulate the dynamics of these 16 fibers using our model. So initially, we only have small fibers, small particles, then during the optimization, we insert the big particles. And this process is dynamic. Then let's look at the, uh, this region, this top right region of this domain. So you can see these two fibers, they exactly form this kind of uh, x shape cross section. But if we look at this bottom region at the center, these two fibers are form a side sub zippering at this domain. So in our simulation, we can also observe the two different forms phenomena of uh, x shape cross section and a side to sub zippering as what we can observe in experiments. So I have discussed how can we simulate or how can we model one hemoglobin and the interactions between hemoglobins. Then by using the hemoglobin model and the interactions, we can simulate the fiber growth, the polymerization of one fiber. Then using the smart scan modeling, we can go beyond the one fiber to simulate a domain of fiber inside the RBC. But if we try to simulate the RBC dynamics, we have we need to build another model to simulate the dynamics of RBC membrane. So I developed the open source software called OpenRBC, which is RBC simulation model or simulation code at the protein resolution. So in the RBC, we have a set of skeleton, which is showing in the picture here by lots of triangles. And in the set of skeleton, we have lots of proteins as shown in the picture here. We have different type, type of, uh, type, different types of proteins. And then we also have a membrane of the lipid part layer. Then our RPC model considers all the details of the protein of the lipid part layer and also the cytoskeleton. So in one RPC in our model, we have in total 4 million particles. So this is a sketch of the RBC in our model. So on the left, I will show uh, the lipid part layer. Then on the right, we show the particle, uh, the proteins and the cytoskeleton. So this code is highly optimized and we can achieve 10 times the speed up compared to a standard MD solver. Due to this uh, high, high optimized code, high computation efficiency, we have won the third prize at the IBM Challenging Contest. So I have discussed how can we simulate the polymerization and also the fiber fermentation in one fiber, in one hemoglobin fiber. Then we, we can use the multi scale model to simulate a domain of fibers by integrating this multi scale modeling of the fibers together with the RPC model, then we can simulate the interaction between the fiber and the membrane, or, and also the RPC cycling. I further considered the, to, to the models of the first two stages of this whole process, the deoxygenation and the nucleation. Then by integrating all these six, six stages of the RPC cycling, we are able to quantitatively predict the RBC cycling dynamics. As an application of the model, we could examine the effect of anti-cycling drugs, for example. Let me consider only one drug shown here. The drug is called Momensin A. So in the experiments in this paper, they can measure the effect of the drug of the Momensin A on the cycle hemoglobin of the RBC cycling. For example, if we have the less concentration of the drug, then the RBC may seek out with a high probability. For example, if we have uh, 1,000 RBCs, then 
for in the low concentration of the of the drug, roughly all the RBCs are sickled. But if we have high concentration of the drug, there may be one or two RBCs are sickled. So we can measure the percentage of the sickling for different concentration of the drug from the experiments. Then we use our model to simulate the dynamics and also the effect of the drug. Because from the experiment data, we know how the drug affects the model. For example, for the drug of mycin A, the key effect of the mycin A is on the is in is on the HBS, the hemoglobin concentration. It has the effect of reducing the concentration of the hemoglobin. Then we can incorporate this kind of effect into our model and then simulate the effect the effect of the drug of the, for the anti-cycling. And the blue curve is our prediction for our model. And the, blue curve, and the uh, black curve is from the experiments. So we can see our model can predict the effect of anti-cycling drugs quantitatively. So machine, so mycin modeling has been used very successful in many applications, as I show in the RPC modeling of the sickle cell drugs. Next, let's go to the machine learning. As I mentioned before, machine learning achieved the great success in a wide range of applications, including image classification, natural language processing, and so on. But, in, but machine learning usually requires a large amount of data. But in many scientific research, it's often difficult to obtain a sufficient data set of high quality. In scientific research, the data measurements could be dinky, dirty, dynamic, or sometimes even deceptive. However, we have the unique advantage in scientific research to incorporate the scientific domain knowledge into our model, including physical principles, constraints, symmetries, and even computational simulations. I aim to develop the scientific machine learning to be accurate, robust, reliable, interpretable, and also explainable. So in the past few years, I have mainly developed a few algorithms. And the first algorithm I would have introduced is called multi fidelity learning. Let me demonstrate the idea of multi fidelity learning using the example of inverse indentation. In the setup of inverse indentation, let's consider we have material shown here. This material has a specific stress strength response in the figure shown here. So the sigma is the stress and the epsilon is the strength. Now we try to predict this curve of this, this stress string curve of the material. And in solid mechanics, a common way to do this is called this indentation method. So we have a machine showing the picture here. And it's the mach this machine has a sharp indenter tip and the showing it here. Then we can push down this indenter tip into this material. Then during this process, we can record the penetration depth of this tip into the material, which is edge, and also the loading force between the tip and this material, which is a P. So initially, the force and the depth is zero. Then if the internal tip goes down, then the force increases. When the force reaches maximum PM, then we lift up this internal tip to the free state. Then the force decreases from this PM to the, small, to the zero value. The first stage is called loading, and the second stage is called unloading. Now we can record this loading and unloading curve. We try to predict this stress string curve from this loading and unloading curve. So this is called the inverse indentation problem. And the main challenge here is that we have a very small data set. Then to address this issue, instead of to learn the mapping from two curves, which is really high dimension, we can use a few key parameters 
to represent this curve, for example, for the uh, stress string curve, it can be represented well by the Young's modulus E, the Young's stress sigma Y, and also Hanani M. And for the loading and under loading unloading curve, we can use the variables HM, the maximum depth, maximum force, PM, the, uh, the slope of the loading curve C, and, uh, the, uh, and also the slope as the maximum value of DP, DH, and also the ratio of the work as shown in the picture here. So basically, we try to learn between these three uh, variables and these five, var five variables. But it's still relatively uh, the three or five dimension learning. It's hard to learn from a very small data set. Then we consider the margin for that strategy by integrating the small data set for experiments and also the data set from the modeling. To, to, uh, let me demonstrate the idea of the margin for that learning using a few more examples. Let's consider the aircraft design. When we design the aircraft, we may have some measurements from the experiments, but this experiment data is very expensive, although they are accurate, but they are very expensive. So this is the high fidelity model or high fidelity data set. But in the meanwhile, we can run the simulations, the 3D simulation or even 2D simulation in final element. The kind of simulation data of course, it's, it's low accuracy. But in the meanwhile, we can have a lot. The simulation is much cheaper than the experiments. Another example is we try to predict the sea surface temperature. So let's consider we have a sea surface as shown in, top, in the picture here. And we have some measurements in the dots here for the temperature on the sea surface. But as you can see, we only have a few measurements and they are very sparse. So this sense, the measurements from these sensors in these dots here, they are accurate, but they are only a few. But in the meanwhile, we can have the temperature from the satellite. The temperature field from the satellite is showing the picture here. They, we have a lot, but they are low accuracy. So there are, lots of, you know, there are many applications. We can have different levels of the data set from the high fidelity and also the low fidelity. And back to our indentation problem, as I mentioned before, we have the measurements from the uh, experiments, but we only have a few. But in the meanwhile, we can run 3D simulations, 3D FEM. We may have uh, roughly 10 measurements of 3D FEM, but we can run even 2D FEM, we may have hundreds. Or even we go one step further, we can consider the empirical relationships based on physical laws developed in, in the past. So I try to integrate all these different measurements, all these informations together to construct a model. The algorithm I proposed is called residual-based multi-fidelity neural network. The key idea here is let's assume we only have two different fidelities, the high fidelity and the low fidelity. Now we try to correlate these two fidelities. Let's say the input of our model is X and the output of the low fidelity model is Y low and the output of the high fidelity model is Y high. Instead of learning, uh, instead of learning this Y high or target high fidelity output directly, Let's consider we try to learn the difference between Y high and Y low. And specifically, we consider the Y high and the Y low, the difference is a function of our input X and also is a function of the low fidelity model Y low. And we consider this function F is written as a weighted summation as a linear function and also a nonlinear function. So this is the basic idea here. Then let's go to the architecture of the network. How can we use the network to represent the equation here? So let's say our input is x1 and x2. Let's assume we have two inputs. And the output of the, high fidelity, the low fidelity is y low. 
let's first construct a one network at an uh, low from this x1 to to y low. Because if we assume we have a good, a large data set for the low fidelity model, then this n low, this low fidelity model, the low fidelity network can be trained well. Then let's reconstruct another model, which is n high, to represent this nonlinear function here, because we know the network is approximator of the nonlinear function. Then for the input of uh, high, we have x1, x2. We also have the y low as input of this uh, high. Then we have the output of this network of the h uh, high. And in the uh, in this domain, basically we have a linear function. So we use the identical activation function to represent the linear function. Then we integrate this nonlinear output for network and also the linear output of from x1 to an y low to construct the output of the high fidelity y high. So let's look at the efficiency of this kind of my fair learning. So we can train the network I show you in the picture here by using the data set from a few different fidelities. So specifically, let's consider we have the experiment data, but only five. So we have five data, data measurements from experiments. And then we have the 3D simulation with the size 14 and the 2D simulation of 100. Let's only look at the last column shown here. By integrating this data set from the experiments, from 3D simulation and 2D simulation, we can achieve the accuracy for predicting the, the sigma y roughly below uh, 5% with the error bar also uh, roughly half 5%. So basically we uh, achieve the absolute accuracy below absolute error below 10%. So as a comparison, if we use the traditional method developed in the literature, that the accuracy of the error is roughly 140%. So as you can see, by integrating all the data measurements from experiments, from 3D simulation, 2D simulation, we can achieve much better accuracy than the traditional methods. So this multi-thread learning method is only learning from the measurements, from different sources of the data measurements. Then let's consider how can we incorporate the physics into the network. So let's use the example in biology, actually it's the ODE system. So let's consider the, uh, the, the biology system of the glucose insulin interaction. So the IP is the insulin, co insulin concentration in the plasma and the II is the insulin concentration of the interstitial. And the G is the glucose concentration. And the IG is glucose from nutritional intake then the dynamics between IP, II, and G and IG can be described by the ODEs I'm showing here. And also we have the auxiliary variable H1, H2, and H3 in the model. But mathematically, we have ODE system of six variables, IP, II, G, H1, H2, and H3. So we have a ODE system. Then in the ODE system, we have lots of unknowing parameters as showing in the red color here. So in the red color, we have in total 21 unknowing parameters. But for the measurements, we only have the measurements for the glucose concentration, G. So in, the, in a time series. So we have the measurements for G basically in one day as showing in the picture here. Now we try to infer the whole dynamics of IP, II, G, and also all these 21 unknowing parameters for only concentration of the G. So this kind of phenomena as is also happening in lots of fluid mechanics applications, for example, in the uh, first field slide I showed before. We have a physics model of the navier stokes equation, similar to this audition here, but we may have a PD. 
we have narrow cost equation. But for the narrow score equation, we have the velocities u v w in the extra direction. We have the concentration. We have we also have the pressure. We have lots of states in the physics model, but we only have the measurements for one or two specific variable. For example, in this uh, in the previous I discussed the any reason model, we only have the measurements for the concentration. We try to pre predict the whole model, the dynamics of the velocities and also pressure from only from the concentration data. And similar here, we have lots of states. We have the IP, II, and G. Then we have a model for IP, II, and G, but we only have one measurement for G. Then how can we develop a model for, for learning from only from the G to infer all the states? So the method is called the physics informed learning or PINs. So there are different versions of PINs has been uh, developed. Let me only consider the standard method, the standard PIN to demonstrate the key idea instead of let's go into the details. So in the PIN, we first have the nano network as showing uh, in, top, in the left figure here. So the network could be the standard network the fully connected network as I show in the picture here, or it could be the, uh, the ResNet or other types of network. But let's consider the standard network. And for this model, the input of the network is the time series is a time T, time variable, because in our model, the variable is only T. Then if we consider we have a free dynamics model in the 3D space, then the model could be the, X, Y, Z, the X coordinate, the y, y coordinate, and also Z coordinate, in addition to the time T. Then for the output of the network, are all the states we try to infer, including all measurements. For example, in this case, our, our output is G, IP, II, H1, H2, and H3. Now we have data measurements for G, only for G. Because we have data, measure for, data measurements for G, then we can construct the loss function for the G output, which is the standard C plus learning. So we have the standard C plus loss function for G. So this is our loss from the data measurements. But in the meanwhile, we try to constrain all the outputs by using the OD system, by using the physics. Without the physics, if you only consider the network, then all the variables here, they are not coupled. So G has nothing to do to IP and, and II and H1, H2 and H3. But if we know these variables to satisfy the PDEs or ODEs, which means we can measure or we can compute the error of the outputs of the OD uh, for the OD, uh, we can measure the OD error from the outputs. For example, initially, when the network is, is randomly initialized, then we can compute what is the OD error, what's the residue of the OD by using this automatic differentiation or back propagation. We can compute this exactly without a grid. Then this kind of error or this mesh of the ODE should also be incorporated in the loss function. Then the total loss function is a weighted summation of loss from the data measurements and also the losses from the ODs. So this kind of strategy can be used to increase the sparse data measurements and also the physics, which is incomplete. So we can have, we have for a physical system, we have the measurements of some variables. And then we have a PDE, but a PDE for the PDE, we have the unknown parameters. For example, all the 21 parameters in this OD system are unknown. They have incomplete physics. Then when we train the model, instead of we, we train the network only, when we train the network simultaneously, we also train the unknown, unknown parameters, the E, also the, the IP, I, the VP, VI in the model. So we minimize the loss function by, by tuning all these 
uh, the network with a bias and also the 21 are knowing parameters simultaneously. Then after the network is, is well trained, then we can infer the 21 are knowing parameters after, at, at the end of the training. And also by using this uh, predict the parameters, we can simulate dynamics over the whole model as shown in the uh, picture here. So we only have the measurements for G, but, can, but we can predict, predict all the dynamics of IP, II, G, and also IG. So this research has been highlighted in a, in a recent research article uh, in Nature Computational Science. So I have discussed the two uh, different algorithms for learning a specific function. Basically, in these two cases, we are only learn a very specific case, the mapping of one function. Now let's go beyond the function learning to operator learning. In the function learning of input and output, they are five dimension. For example, in image classification, the, in, the input is an image. It could be 20 by 20 pixels, which is 400 dimension. And our output is our only scalar. Then let's go beyond the function learning to operator learning. Here, the operator means a mapping from one function to another function. And then we know the functions are infinite dimension. So operator could be mathematical operators like the derivative or integral. Or it could be a dynamic system. In a dynamic system, we have the input signal and output signal. Or it could be a defined uh, biological, system, biological system or social system. Then how can we learn this kind of operator if you're using the network? Let me introduce the notation here. Let's consider the operator we try to learn is called G. So G is our operator. And the input of this operator is called U. And the G maps the input function U, the U is a function, into another function that's called GU. So U and GU are their functions. Because GU is a function, then we consider in the domain of GU, we have a, a, a point Y. Then GUY is the output of the function of GU. So u is a function, and the gu is another function, and the guy is a scalar. Then in our, in our paper, we have developed a few different versions of deeper net for learning operators. And here, let me only show you one version. So roughly speaking, the network are split into two parts. In the top part, we have a branch net. So we have one network called branch net. And for the branch net, our input is u. This is u function. And for the u function, we assume we have some uh, observations of u at the locations x1, x2, and xm. Then we use these measurements of u into our branch net. And for the output of branch net, we have b1, b2, and bp. We have one vector. Then in the meanwhile, we have another network for the trunk net. And for the trunk net, we have input y. And for the output for the trunk net, we have t1, t2, and pp, to, uh, to, and tp. We have another vector. Then we compute the dot product between the p, between the b1 to bp and t1 to tp, as shown in the equation here, to compute the goy. So goy is the dot product between b and p. So I will not go into the details of this construction of the network, but roughly speaking, the key, the ideas of this kind of construction is as follows. So first we assume if we look at the GUI, because we know GUI is a function of Y, right? So GUI definitely is a function of Y. Then we can write this function of Y, GUI, as a weighted summation of the basis function of Y. So roughly speaking, the TKY, T1Y, T2Y, and the TPY, they are basis function of Y. And B1 to BP, they are the coefficients in front of the basis function. Which means we use the trunk, trunk net to automatically learn the basis function. And we use the branch net 
to learn the coefficients of the basis function. So this is one idea, what do we construct the network in this way? So I will not go into the details of the network design. And then, you know, you know, people, we have tested this network design in lots of, I actually, in total 16 different mathematical equations. For example, if we have a diffusion reaction system, then the input of our network could be the initial condition of the diffusion equation. And the output is the solution. Or the input could be the uh, fourth term of the, of the PDE, then the output is the solution of the PDE. But here, let me use the application of the bubble dynamics. Let's consider we have a water background. And in the water, we have the bubbles. We may have the nanoscale bubble, the small bubble, and then we have the large scale bubble of the one micro, or even large scale. Then we try to simulate the dynamics of the bubble. Specifically, if we have a different pressure of the water, then we may have different bubble radius. If the pressure is small, then the bubble is large. If the pressure is large, then the bubble becomes small. And then we can see the pressure is dynamically changed. So pressure is a, is a function of time. Then the dynamics between the pressure and the bubble size can be described by this RP equation shown here, if the bubble is large. But if the bubble is small, we should consider the uh, particle simulation, for example, by using the uh, dissipative particle dynamics. But here, we aim to learn the relationship between the pressure and the bubble radius by using the dipole net. So for the dipole net, specifically as this case, the input is a, the pressure as a function of time. So the pressure at different time incidents. And the trunk net is the time we try to predict in the future, time t, and also the initial bubble size. And the output of our dipole net is the radius of the bubble at the future time t. So here is one simulation of the DPD simulation. We decrease the pr uh, pressure of the system by increasing the top wall. And we can see the and the bubble becomes larger. Then we can generate the data, the data set from uh, the larger scale RP equation and the small scale, the uh, DPD simulation. Then we can train the dipole net from the, uh, from the data. Then we can see after the network is trained in the larger scale, the, uh, the dipole net matches the RP equation and in the small scale matches the DPD simulation. And in between, the RP equation, the DPD simulation, and our dipole net position, they are consistent. So these are uh, the algorithms I developed. I only briefly discussed the detail, I only briefly discussed these algorithms to demonstrate what's the key idea instead of going to the details. In the last slide, let me show you the open source software I just developed. So in a recent initial paper, discussed the importance of the computer course on science. So I aim to develop the software DPSDE as a platform of the emerging field in for, uh, physics form deep learning. And uh, since the first uh, uh, release uh, in July uh, 2019, it has been downloaded more than 80,000 times. And it has been used in many universities and also national labs and uh, companies. So, so in the future, I hope the software can be as can be used as a platform for the mass of the development de uh, development development in the field of uh, physics form of deeper learning by incorporating different methods, the uh, modified learning, the physics form learning, and the operation learning. Yeah, that's the my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Lou, for like uh, the. So hologram of all the details, like, you know, you have like working on from multi-scale to like, you know, physical informed deep learning. So uh, I'll first give floor to the audience. Like if you have questions, um, would you please just raise your hand or you, you can just unmute yourself to ask the questions. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, I'm Yu Jiang, I'm from, Arto University in Finland. 
and Dr. Lu, your presentation is really interesting. Although it's uh, one hour, it's always attract my attention. So uh, there are quite a lot of works, I think, uh, by what's work. And my question is here about uh, multi-fidelity learning. So on the page 26. Mm. So I, I don't understand what's the uh, what's the purpose of this time H alpha one and time. H alpha 2. Ah, mm. uh, yes. So the alpha 1 here, so the question is about what's the alpha 1 and alpha 2. So actually, in my yeah. uh, presentation, I didn't go into the details of alpha 1 and alpha 2. Basically, in a, the idea is we have a weighted summation of this nonlinear of, of this linear function and this nonlinear function. But how can we choose the weights? Instead of choose the weights manually, we consider the weights. So first is we normalize the weights to between the net one and, uh, to two and one. So that's why we use the, uh, the hyperbolic tangent in front of F1 and F2. And also the F1 and F2, they are trainable. So basically we automatically tune the weights or train the weights using our data. Instead though, we pre-select the values of F1 and F2. Basically they are weights, but are dynamically trained weights of these two functions. Okay, thank you. Then I get the idea. Thank you very much. That's my question. Hi, Jeffrey. Right, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question pertains to the, uh, the system of ODE constrained uh, uh, neural network where you only saw the, uh, you only measure the G, uh, yes. G function trajectory. Uh, can you address the uniqueness of the solutions for, for the other unobserved uh, functions, IP all the way down to H3? Uh, are you relying on supervised training uh, so that the neural network would resolve uh, non-uniqueness of the solution? Or maybe the solution is unique. I don't, I don't know what, what should come out of these equations. Yes. But assuming if you only observe G, then, then for the other functions, the solution would be non-unique, then, then uh, can you address that? Yes, actually this is a, a very good question. So in many cases, if you try to infer the whole system from only partial observed data, then it's highly possible that the system is non-unique, the solution is non-unique. But here for this specific case, this specific case is designed, the solution is actually is unique. So this is for this case. So if the solution is unique, then we can find the solution. But for the question is, if the solution is non-unique, actually we also tested other cases, both on ODEs and PDEs. For example, if the ODEs have a non-unique solution, actually there are some details. For example, if we consider in the system, we have 20 only uh, to total 21 unknown parameters, then some parameters may have the can be uh, identified about from our measurements. Then for those parameters, we can predict the value of these uh, parameters. But for the unknowing, of, for another set of parameters, which is cannot be identified by our data measurements, then the, the network may converge to arbitrary solution, possible solution. So this is uh, roughly speaking, for the non-uniqueness. So basically for non-unique solution, if, we, if our system or if our unobserved states is non-unique, then we cannot guarantee what's the final solution of the network. It may converge to, let's say the, uh, the solution or it may converge to another solution, which is also the solution of the system, but it's not the solution of our target because the solution is non-unique. Then to address this issue, there are some methods we can apply. For example, we can use the regularization. If we consider we only, among all these non-unique solution, we try to find a solution that is the most the smooth, uh, smoothest one. Then we can apply the, the L2 or L1 regularization on the network. That's what we can do for non-uniqueness. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
So I see Gabe's like a raised hand. So like, you know, Gabe, maybe you want to like go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I've been following this uh, train of research and it's really neat. So my question, I guess I'm trying to square the circle in my mind on this topic here. I definitely get the main concept here where you're going to supplement the lack of data by being able to interrogate the system and fill in a bunch of new pieces of evidence by checking how you are evaluating against the governing equations. Yes. That's, it's, that's very good. And using Autodiff is, is a good idea too. I'm, I'm wondering like, basically then you are mm. using the neural network as the field to hold all of these things. So you're, instead of describing them with the way that we would normally do in ODEs and PDEs with arrays, you're building up this function automatically with the neural network. How sensitive is this, you know? Like I know mm. neural networks are universal just approximators, but mm. if you use a different architecture, does the whole thing go away or you know, how, does this tell you how many times you have to check? Like, is the sampling of this, of the governing equations uh, dependent on the architecture you pick? And then since you've got, I, I can't quite tell uh, if you're using a single loss function, is this like a mm. weighting of all these other things or are you stochastically switching between them? So like, I guess maybe this is more of a detailed question, but mm. how, how sensitive is this on the details like this? Or is it like, don't worry, it always works? Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Actually, actually, there are many details in this framework. So first, let's briefly discuss the uh, network. Mm -hmm. So the, the good news here is in practice, we found that the network, uh, the solution let's say of our prediction is not sensitive to the network architecture. Mm -hmm. So the guidelines, we cannot definitely, we should definitely say that the network should be large enough. So if the network is too small, then we cannot represent the functions well. Yeah. Then when the network is large enough to, pre to, pre to represent the function, then basically we can achieve a good accuracy because one main idea here is when we train the network, even if the network is, is, is larger than our required size, then due to training of the SGD, the historic gradient descent, we would automatically converge to some smooth solution. Or in some sense, the network right. prefers smooth solution. Right. Then, yes. That's why even if we select a larger network, we do not have the issue of overfitting in practice, especially in this case, if we have the ODs or PDs as a constraint of the network. This kind of yeah. constraint can really prevent the overfitting of the training. Sure. Yeah, this is the one thing. And another thing for the loss function. So the loss function, as I mentioned, is a weighted summation of all the losses of the data measurements of the uh, residual of the ODs or PDs. Then during, during our training, uh, there are a few different ways to do it. Of course, we can directly apply this weighted summation of the loss function and train from scratch. Then of course, how to select weights is another issue. So, but in, instead of training all the losses directly from scratch, what we do uh, in this paper, I found uh, in practice would be beneficial is that we first train the loss function only from the data. So in the first, let's say 1000 iterations, we only use the data measurements as loss function. Then it's all, we switch the loss function from only the data measurements into the total loss function of the loss and also of the data loss and also PD loss or OD loss. Then in this way, we can speed up the training. Is that because the auto diff functions are more expensive to evaluate or is that because the kind of 
loss function space is more complicated when you add in these equations relative than when you only have the data. Yes, so if we train all the losses, then you can see we have this basically rough flex and there's a balance between the data loss and the PD loss. Mm. Then the convergence of the network to the data measurements would be slower because we try to also satisfy the PDE loss. But if we train the data measurements first, then we can directly go to the data measurements first or match the data measurements first. Then we constrain the PDE. In this two way training, or we can basically speed up the training, uh, the or we can speed up the training for the uh, data loss. So otherwise, during the training, we would slowly convert it into data loss and also the PD loss. Okay. Mm. Basically, you have lots of these things to balance. You try to pick the most important one first, then go to the all, all the uh, losses. Okay. Mm. All right. So thanks for all the questions. And I see like a Yogi actually like, you know, write also several questions like, you know, there. Um, and uh, so maybe like the things we can take offline and send directly mail to like a Lulu, like, you know, about like, you know, all the questions. But just, I just want to give one comment is that um, mm -hmm. as well as for my questions, like I have a lot, is that there seems to be a lot of um, concern about the robustness and the unique, mm. uniqueness of the, this training because we a lot of time treat like a neural network as to some degree a black box, but I feel mm. to, uh, to some degree like Lou is actually trying to treat that as a gray box. So instead of like completely white, completely black, like something in the middle. So uh, to some degree we can give a, get, get, give a peek into like what is going on and hopefully like to understand a little bit more. And uh, that's especially like, you know, especially I was concerned is because I was doing a lot of experiment and in experiment, there's un unfortunately there's an un 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 unavoidably there are noise mm. and which is like corrupted yes. data, as you mentioned, mm. inky data, like a uh, turbid data, all the things. Uh, with that being said, like, you know, let's give like, you know, Lulu a like a plus like, you know, for his, like, you know, a lot of, like, you know, resources, like, you know, have been provided to us and also the PDX, uh, D, uh, like, you know, PDXPE, like a deep XPE, sorry, like, you know, he's like, you know, platform has developed, like, and we can take off soon. So thank you very much for your, like, you know, talk. And, uh, um, and uh, so thank you very much for everybody who joined us. And the next week, uh, we will have another guest talk about, like, you know, the extreme event in flu, um, flu mechanics and how to, like, understand predict and monitoring that. So with that, I want to thank everybody else and uh, like, you know, have a good one. Have a good, good morning, good night, good, uh, good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lulu. Bye. Thank you.